Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, public seminar hosted by the Monash European Union Center, the Michael Center for Ukrainian Studies, and the History Program of the Arts Faculty at Monash uh, University. We have a very prestigious uh, guest with us tonight, Professor Norman Davis, and I would like to welcome him to Monash. I think it's the second time he's been here and to introduce him now. So Professor Norman Davies was educated at Bolton School, Morgan College, Oxford, the University of Sussex, and at several continental universities, including Grenoble, Perugia, and Krakow. Um, his formative years created a lifelong European outlook, and these were unconventional uh, formative years. Um, how did he develop his special interest in Central and Eastern Europe? Well, if you read uh, his biography, which uh, he put on his website, he will tell you that um, he, uh, it started in 1958 when poor school leavers drove from Lancashire to Istanbul and back in an ex-US Army jeep. And then there were further new adventures, and along the way he picked up a Russian and also a PhD at the Jagiellonian University. And what I found very interesting as well is that unlike most academics, Professor Norman Davis began his career as a school teacher. So he taught for four years uh, at the girls' school and then at St. Paul's. And having taught myself uh, also as a you know, primary school teacher, but it was a brief experience last for four years and also in secondary school. I have to say that it's much harder to be a school teacher than a professor. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is <laughs> so that is for us probably why Professor Davis is such a good uh, communicator. Now, why is he such a good communicator? It's not just because he had a training as a school teacher, but also because he was a, a pupil of uh, A.G.P. Taylor, and the nephew of a well-known Lancaster sportsman and broadcaster. So he was kind of bred, you know, uh, in the media and publishing um, culture. So he emerged as a historical author with White Eagle, Red Star, the Polish uh, Soviet uh, War, 1920. Uh, and he found his way to radio and major TV via the BBC. Um, World Service, to which he made contributions relative to current affairs in the Soviet bloc. And he was for many years professor of history at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, University of London, and has also taught as a visitor to Columbia, McGill, Hokkaido, Stanford, Harvard, and in this part of the world, Adelaide, the uh, ANU um, in uh, Canberra. Now, in addition to White Eagle Red Star, is the author of God's Playground, The History of Poland which was adopted by Poland's Ministry of Education as compulsory reading for all history students in state schools and universities. Um, uh, Europe and history, I think a lot of us have, have read that one, which came, and we became a number of one best ever in Britain. The Eyes of History, Michael Cole's portrait of a Central European City with Roger Morehouse, Rising 44, The Battle for Warsaw, Europe at War, 1939-45, and most recently, Spanish Kingdoms. Now his books have been translated into more than 20 languages, with the Jean-Paul Moore. Um, he has many awards and distinctions. From 1997 to 2006, he was a supernumerary a fellow at Wilson College, Oxford, and is now an honorary fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and professor at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow has been a fellow of the British Academy since 1997 and since 2011 of the Learned Society of Wales. He has been awarded Poland's Order of the White Eagle and in Britain the CMG for Services to History. He holds honorary doctors from several universities in Britain and Poland as well as the honorary citizenship of five cities and is a life member of Rose of Clermont and of Peter House, Cambridge. Now he's visiting Australia as a special guest at the Australian Institute of Polish Affairs. And I have the pleasure to say that uh, this is not the first uh, event that we do together, so it's only been very successful. This looks like it's going to be a very successful event again. He's also a visiting fellow of the University of Tasmania. 
Mm. Now, the topic of his talk is very much in the news. It's Ukraine between the EU and Russia. The floor is yours. Didn't notice them. They didn't 
think they were in for. Uh, they discounted them, uh, and it never struck them that these creatures were um, beings with uh, history, culture, and sort of rights of their own. It's as though they weren't there. Uh, they were just a part of the global fauna, like the kangaroos or the, the bulldogs or... Um. Now, when the uh, Russians, or I might say the Muscovites, because the, the Muscovites only adopted the name of Russia, Russia, in the early 18th century. And what the world known, knows as, as Russia, of course, was something that grew out of the, 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 the Grand Duchy of Moscow. When they <coughs> started moving into Ukraine in the uh, late 17th and 18th, early 18th century, they too saw Aborigines walking around and living. But these, what we might call Ukrainian Aborigines, um, were not regarded as people who had any traditions of their own or any culture or any rights. They were people who were part of the landscape who simply had to accept everything that the the Russians told them they were. Uh, and I think Australians can probably understand that analogy. Uh, what is more, many Western Russians, uh, never having learned anything other than the Russian version of history, uh, tend to repeat rather mindlessly everything that they, the Russians tell them or that they read in Russian books. Um, and I'll give you, <coughs> uh, I think, a good example. <coughs> uh, in September 1939, uh, Stalin's Red Army marched into the last little piece of Ukraine that had escaped the Moscovite, Moscovite army to the previous detention. This is what we now call Western Ukraine. Uh, at the time, it was known as East Galicia. It was part of, of Poland. Uh, and, of course, Stalin and his advisors in the good old tradition maintain they weren't aggressing against Poland. All they were doing was taking back that which had been torn away. And they actually called 1939, that they used the same phrase as Catherine the Great, and they called Western Ukraine, stroke East Galicia, the recovered lands. Uh, now, this is still more surprising. Quite a lot of British people agree with what we said. There was a, um, a number of articles written in the British press. One by David Lloyd George, now the former uh, Prime Minister. And David Lloyd George <coughs> said that um, following the, the Nazi Soviet attack, the German invasion of Western Poland was, of course, a nasty piece of aggression. But Stalin's liberation uh, of the eastern part of Poland was, of course, a perfectly understandable act of statesmanship. Uh, there were a number of protests about this, but the Decisive voice, voice was given to none other than Sir Vernon Pears, who was the director of the School of Slavonic Studies in London, where I worked later on 
I the leading Slavist, Slavicist of the generation. And Sir Bernard wrote an article saying that Premier Lloyd George was perfectly right. East Galicia was inhabited mainly by Russians. He didn't even say Rosinians or Ukrainians, he said Russians. And then the British war censorship came down, and when the Polish ambassador tried to ask for the right of reply, he was told to go away and uh, don't complicate matters. Um, it is a chief British authority in Slavic matters repeating the, the, the old hoary fiction that we trade in by just the same as, as Russians. Uh, briefly, therefore, let me um, say one or two words. Um, firstly, about the term Ukraina, and then uh, very, very rapidly, uh, a sentence about each of the main periods of Ukrainian history. The point of which is to show you that if you didn't know that Ukrainian history is in fact very different from Russian history. The word Ukraina means on the edge. And it's very, very similar uh, to what the Americans used in North America, the word the frontier, the edge of inhabited, assembled land. And just as the American frontier was pushed westward, across North America, so the uh, Ukraina, the frontier of Europe in the East, was pushed um, successively uh, west by different um, ways of settlement. Uh, the big question, of course, is of what is Ukraina on the edge of it? The term came into existence, as far as I know, in, in the Middle Ages, quite a long time ago. Uh, before, incidentally, there was anything sort of a, a Russian state. Um, and it could have had one or two, or two or three different meanings. It could have meant Ukraine on the edge of um, settlement, human settlement. Uh, in the late Middle Ages, the Ukraine um, was largely uh, uh, coincidental with the river Dnieper. There were settlements in the north, there was Kiev on the river in the middle, and down in the south um, was Crimea with its ancient Greek cities. Um, where Mr. Putin said Crimea has always been part of Russia, I don't think he was. But perhaps he thought the ancient Greeks, Thessalonians, uh, were somehow Russian. <laughs> uh, but large parts of Ukraine were empty, like the American prairies, and they had uh, yet to be settled. Uh, another possible meaning of Ukraine is. Uh, the frontier between Christendom and Islam. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the 13th century, the, uh, the Mongol whole horde swept into Eastern Europe, and the remnants of the Mo uh, Mongol horde settled as Tartars in Crimea, in the of modern day Ukraine. And a, the frontier between Christendom, Christian lands, and the Muslim lands uh, ran through Ukraine. Um, a third possibility 
is that Ukraina meant the frontier, the furthest part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. That in, uh, now run through the, um, uh, the periods of Ukrainian history. Uh, the first period, in the almost in the midst of time, in the 9th and 10th century, is what became known as Kiev and Rus. The Rus, R U S O S I, not incidentally Russia. Like again, one of the fictions of the uh, the Muscovites always translated the Rus as Russia. Uh, it has nothing to do with Russia. Moscow itself had not even been created at that time. Um, and Kievan Rus um, uh, based in, in Kiev came about at the time when there was no Russia and essentially there was no Ukraine. There was no settlement or no, no consciousness of, of, of Ukrainianness at the time. But what there was were Orthodox Slavs who had been converted by Byzantine missionaries and who regarded the Patriarch of Constantinople as their leader. Um, the next period is usually called the Mongol Yoke, i.e. the 13th century when the the hordes of uh, Genghis Khan and so on uh, tear through uh, Eastern Europe, uh, destroying Kiev, destroying um, uh, Krakow, a long way away to the west. Um, however, in what, in the, let's call them the Dnieper lands, the, uh, the Mongol yoke lasted much shorter time than it did in the east, in Moscow. Moscow said spent centuries pushing back the, uh, the Tata York. Uh, what happened in the Dnieper lands is that Kiev and Ukraina are taken over by the Grand Duchy of Lithuania from the north. And the Grand Duchy of Lithuania about which you can read in my latest book, uh, Spanish Kingdoms, uh, is an extraordinarily interesting place, once the biggest state in the whole of Europe. Uh, it was an amalgam of, to begin with, uh, pagan Lithuanian warriors and elite with a majority of Ruthenian, what we would now call Yellow Russian um, people who formed a community in the north and then in the 14th century swept to the south and took over Ukraine, the incorporated Ukraine. Kiev was incorporated in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in 1362 and this is what kept Ukraine out of the Russian sphere. It was in the Lithuanian sphere for three to four hundred years. Lithuania itself fell into the Polish sphere by a marriage between the, uh, the Grand Duke of Lithuania and the um, heiress to the Kingdom of Poland. So that the Grand Duchy of Lithuania is part of what later became the Commonwealth of Poland Lithuania. Uh, it is largely, its elite is largely. Colonized, uh, and it includes Ukraine, what we would now call Poland, but as well uh, Lithuania and the Baltic states, Belarus and Ukraine, massive great states. Um, in the later part of, uh, of that uh, Polish period, the whole of Ukraine, the whole of Ukraine is in the Kingdom of Poland. Kiev is in the Kingdom of Poland. Um, which, is, again, is one of the reasons why Ukraine is different from its uh, Russian neighbor. I shouldn't say we're now teaching, of course, about all of this in, um, in Stanford, in California. I put a map 
and my uh, the door of my study to advertise what I was talking about. And there was the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland, with Kiev, far from being at the edge, Kiev was uh, um, the, the Kingdom of Poland stretched all the way to the Don. And I remember an American professor, leading American historian, saying, Mom and Dad, this is just made this all up. <laughs> Kiev has never been involved, but it has. Uh, and that's part of the story that we have to learn. Um, then we come to the Mos Muscovite con conquest, which happened piecemeal uh, between uh, the mid 17th and the end of the 18th century. Uh, and at each stage, the uh, Aborigines, as I call them, the local people of Ukraine, uh, have several things imposed on them. One, they were coerced into accepting the Patriarch of Moscow as the head of their Orthodox Church, and they were forced to become Russian Orthodox. Uh, previously, they had been Orthodox of the Slavonic Rite, recognizing the Patriarch of Constantinople. But the Russian Orthodoxy is forced on them. Uh, secondly, they have to accept an identity with the Russian force on them. They change their name. They call the Ruthenians now Little Russians. The name that the Moscovite propagandists put out uh, for Ukraine is Malarasia, Little Russia. And the name of Ukraine becomes, of course, banned. Uh, and uh, thirdly, they have, the locals have to accept allegiance to the Tsar of Russia. Um, um, now, the, very briefly, in the 19th century, when most, almost all Ukraine is within the, the Russian Empire, uh, there are intense waves of Russification. Both um, through education of banning the Ukrainian language and imposing the Russian language beyond the uh, official medium, but also by the uh, migration of large numbers of the Russians into the Ukraine. Um, uh, some of these came as industrial workers to uh, cities like Donetsk, they you know the Donbass. Industrial base in the, the Don in the East. Others came as agricultural settlers uh, to the south. Um, the whole of the lands which Russia took, um, which the Ottomans had torn away from Russia, uh, the, 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 the Russians took from the Ottoman Empire in the south, were renamed New Russia, and they were settled. By, largely by migrants coming from Russia. So the city like Odessa, completely new at the beginning of the 19th century, was founded as the port of New Russia. Uh, in resistance to this, the um, locals invent, invent a new identity for themselves. They call themselves, begin to call themselves Ukraine which means we are not Russian. <laughs> uh, and that was a long process. Um, in the 20th century, um, the uh, horrors of Ukraine multiplied. It's one of the most tragic countries of Europe. In the uh, from 1932 to 33, as punishment for their uh, refusal to accept uh, Soviet rule and Stalin um, organized the, the, the terror famine, uh, a lot of war, in which the same similar numbers, similar millions of people died 
than the Jewish Holocaust. In the Second World War, more Ukrainians died than any other nationality. <coughs> Westerners who were careless about these matters tend to talk about the Soviet Union as though it was Russia. Where only about 50% of the Soviet Union was, was Russia. And of the 27 million Soviet losses during the war, the biggest group are Ukrainians. Uh, there are military casualties, vast numbers, 30 million, of which there are a lot of Russians indeed. But among the civilian casualties, it's Ukrainians who are the principal sufferers. Just look at the map. The German armies never occupied Russia. They got into the edges of Russia, but it was Ukraine and Belarus and the Baltic states that were occupied, not, uh, not Russia. And then there's the whole story of Soviet rule of exploitation in Ukraine. Ukraine ought to be the uh, richest, most prosperous uh, country in that part of the world. Uh, it should be a land flowing in the open country. But the uh, Soviet planning ensured that Ukraine was used as a, um, a source of material and which flowed largely no. Now, I see I've, uh, I did start a bit later, I don't know whether anybody was responding, I've just got to the beginning of my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I intended to do, unless I'm stopped, is to talk about three different sorts of misconceptions about Ukraine that you meet in the papers all the time. Um, the first one is about history. I've already hinted pretty strongly about that. Um, uh, the misconception is that Ukraine, the history of Ukraine, is just a subdivision of Russian history from the beginning in Kiev and Rush uh, to Soviet uh, time. Um, i.e. So, uh, Ukrainian history is no right about the history of other nations to be studied in its own right. It's just a subdivision of Russian things. Uh, and uh, again, I can give a couple of hours on this subject. It's extremely interesting, but it's um, uh, this phenomenon of the Russian fiction being um, uh, promoted as a you know, solid history, goes back right into the Middle Ages. Um, if you're interested, the, one of the founders of the Ukrainian historiography, you know, Khrushchevsky, uh, published a brilliant analysis of this in 1904, showing how the uh, uh, propagandists of Ivan the Terrible who started what they call the gathering of the lands, was inventing history to, um, uh, to match uh, the, uh, the policies of the day. Uh, and you know, going right back to Ivan the Terrible, the three propositions. One is that the Rus, i.e. Rutina, is the same thing as Russia, which it isn't. Uh, the second pro uh, proposition was that uh, the Grand Duke of Moscow, Ivan, was the God-given ruler of all the East Slavs. This was an assumption, even though most of the East Slavs were not uh, subject to the Grand Duke of Moscow. And thirdly, uh, that the Patriarch of Moscow inheritor of third Rome after the fall of Constantinople was the true and only leader of all the Orthodox Slavs. In other words, history and identity are being mobilized from the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, in order to justify political and territorial expansionism. Uh, 
I'll just give you one test case, I think, or one because it applies to the most of the And this is the identity of the same Vladimir. Or, as the Ukrainians would say, the same Volodymyr, uh, who was baptized in Crimea in the, the 10th century. Uh, by, of course, a Byzantine nation, not by Moscow didn't exist. And the big question, it wasn't Vladimir a Russian or a Ukrainian. And the answer is neither. He lived at a time when there was no such place as Russia and when there was no such consciousness of Ukraine. And the parallel, the very good parallel from, from Western Europe, namely Charlemagne. All the French textbooks tell you that Charlemagne was the uh, the French, a proto French, and he was the ancestor of the, uh, you know, the line of, uh, of French kings. German textbooks say that Karl de Grosse was a German. So, was Charlemagne a Frenchman or a, a, a German? Yes, he was neither. He lived in the 8th and early 9th century where there was no such place as France. Right? Uh, where did even the Holy Roman Empire had not yet been founded. And what language did Charlemagne speak? Answer is Frankish, which is the nearest modern equivalent is Flemish. Uh, Saint Vladimir is a ruler <coughs> of the same order. He's not Russian. He's not Ukrainian. He's something um, from an age before those concepts had any application. Like Alfred the Great. You now the English claim that Alfred the Great was English. Of course, he. There's no such place as the Kingdom of England in Alfred. Um, i.e. the English <coughs> play the same trick as the Moscovites and like most imperial powers so project their history backwards to appropriate everything uh, that pleases them in the past. Um, and I think the technical term of this is retrospective history. <laughs> okay, the second um, English are past masters of that as a world <laughs> the second misconception is, is about language. The false contention that Ukrainians is just a dialect of Russian. Uh, this was the official theory in uh, Tsarist days before 1917, where officially there was no such thing as the Ukrainian language. It was just a dialect, a variant of great Russian, the language of, of Moscovy. Um, uh, if you think of it, it's just as possible to argue that Russian is a dialect of Ukrainian. It's exactly the same the word misconception. And perhaps it, I explain this to my students by an analogy and analogy um, with the difference between German and Dutch. One German language, a large language associated in modern times with a powerful state of nation. And the smaller community in the Netherlands which speaks a related but different language. Uh, German and Dutch both have the same origin. Dutch means Dutch. Right? It's the same word. If you go far enough back, Dutch and German were come from the same roots. However, over centuries of living the past, uh, the, the Dutch of the Netherlands uh, gave their language a new term. They gave it a geographical name, i.e. Netherlands. Netherlands means Dutch. 
Uh, and if you've ever had any doubt, just go to a Dutchman and say, excuse me, are you speaking German? And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's very similar with Ukrainian. Uh, Russian and Ukrainian have common roots. And they're called Rus. Kiev and Rus, the adjective is Rus. Uh, but originally, Ruski applied to uh, the common language from which Russian and Ukrainian and incidentally white root Indian, now known as Gelo Russian, um, emanated. So just as Dutch and Deutsch have common roots, so the Ruski of Ukraine and the Ruski of Moscow have common roots. But then, because of this long separate history, they're not only different in many ways linguistically, they are the identity marker by which Ukrainians differentiate themselves from Russians. Uh, the last uh, misconception uh, is the regional one, uh, and uh, it refers to that part of Ukraine, Western Ukraine, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, namely, uh, the idea that Ukraine is split in two parts, one Western, one Eastern, and that under the present political strategy, there will be a split between the two of them. Uh, I don't believe this is an accurate thing at all. Uh, the Western Ukraine I mentioned, as in 1939, has vanished. It's been completely transformed. Uh, it had a very large Jewish population, which was killed, exterminated by the uh, Germans during the war. It had a very large Polish population. Uh, uh, population, including my in-laws, who were expelled uh, at the end of the Second World War, and the, um, as it were, the empty places of Western Ukraine were filled by incoming Soviets of all sorts, uh, Russians, Ukrainians from the East, and of course others from Central Asia and beyond. So I, uh, Western Ukraine no longer has specific characteristics of the history and in And I would see Ukraine as the country of several regions, uh, five or six regions, um, which together make up a, a coherent whole. Uh, and what is really interesting is that the the Russian speakers in this mix, uh, the Russians are a significant, but by no means a prominent uh, majority. The Russian speakers, in overwhelming numbers, don't want to have anything to do with Putin's Russia. Kiev is a Russian speaking city. Put it otherwise. Because of the 19th century and the Russification that went on, Kiev became a Russian, a largely Russian speaking city. But any of you that have looked at your television screens, you'll see that the people of Kiev don't want to have anything to do with Putin. It's Russian. And what we, the things we hear of every day, ethnic Russians want to join us. Don't believe it, it's, it's, it's just uh, another of these uh, fictions. Now, I, I ought to get to um, Europe. Um, That's the second part of my lecture. Um, and uh, I might make an important distinction here that between um, Brussels, the European organization, and the, uh, uh, the, the member states of the European Union, many of which, a dozen of which 
for one's soul, it's fear. The Crimea crisis is bringing um, like East European affairs to the fore for the first time that the European Union has been in existence since the in 1991. Um, and it's also bringing uh, Europeans from the former Soviet bloc countries, especially from Poland, uh, to a prominent place. Uh, in the, in the role played by Alexander Kraszniewski, or the uh, foreign minister Radek Sikorski, who led the ill-fated attempt to um, persuade Mr. Yanukovych to, to negotiate. But, uh, Sikorski was taking the German foreign minister the initiative was not coming either from Brussels or from Berlin. Um, I'm not mentioning NATO. NATO is another part of the European constellation. But there's one member of NATO that nobody mentions there, a country which holds the key to the Crimean crisis. And that's Turkey. Turkey is not a fundamental Balkan country. It's a great big regional power, which could close the Black Sea to the Russian fleet at a snap of a finger. Of course, it would be breaking treaties and if they all, all hell would break loose. But the Russian Black Sea fleet is useless if the Turks would ever follow the prosperous. And you can be sure the Turks are watching what happened in Crimea as closely as anybody else. After all, Crimea was there, and Putin wasn't yet heard of it. So, uh, Turkey is a, the major regional power in those parts. Uh, and Turkey is a member of NATO. Um, two minutes and then I'll stop. Uh, uh, I'll go back to where I started talking about knowledge of the region. Um, everything that I've said today is very well known in uh, the former Eastern Bloc. Warsaw or Prague or Budapest or Tallinn or you know, um, it's not very well known in the Western world because the Western world has been complacent about where it gets its information from. Um, but you can be sure that with the rise of um, uh, European member states, there is clear theories in there. Their, their knowledge of the region is going to rise to the top. Um, and one of the things that we're saying is that Vladimir Putin is not some sort of aberrant maverick. Uh, he's an absolutely standard mainline Russian nationalist. Putin's collective wit and wisdom <coughs> in saying two famous quotations, among other. And one that I'm sure everybody's heard is that the collapse of the Soviet Union is the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And the other I've spoken to President George W. Bush was that Ukraine is not a real country. Well, the Duke of Wellington said, if you could believe that, you can believe anything. Thank you very much.